What I'd like to talk about today is something that's happening in Buddhism in America that I feel very badly about. And that is that Buddhism is not being carried out as it should be, which is step to step to step to step, like a path. And each step is a step of development. And in each step, we learn to develop our qualities. That is to say that our qualities and um, our attitudes and our uh, uh, well, qualities, is all you can say, it would be like the deity. And so we grow to be like the deity, whichever is our deity, whether it be Chinreze or Tara or Guru Rinpoche, whichever is the deity that we practice. And if we're in Nundra, we practice several. Uh, but we take up the qualities of these beings, of these Buddhas, and we think that this is the doorway to learning how to uh, tr practice true Buddhism is to change our um, ordinary nature. Not change it, actually, but more like awaken to our primordial wisdom nature and move away from this ordinary nature that causes us to, us to suffer so badly. And we do suffer. Uh, everything that starts has an end. Everything that comes together must separate. Everything that lives dies. And so there are many, many um, uh, things about samsara that are really beyond hideous. And when we look to transformation or awakening to the Buddha nature, which is that nature that precludes suffering, and does not contain suffering. When we look to that, we think, you know, that's, that's what we really want. And yet, we still do not know how to turn away from samsara. Even if we are miserably unhappy, we still do not know how to turn away from samsara. We still look to the things in samsara that used to satisfy us, thinking that they will still satisfy us. And as we grow, that's not possible. As we learn, that's not possible. So we are told um, to practice a path. It's like the seed um, and, the, and the fruit are the same thing. So you practice the path in such a way that you go from the seed to the fruit that you go from uh, the ground to the path to the accomplishment. And this is how it's done. In this country now, uh, as Buddhism has moved west, this is not exactly west, but we think of it as west in Buddhism. As Buddhism moves to the west, we discover that it's taken on some of the habits of western people. And some Western people are very resistant to devotion, very resistant to the idea that they might want to change themselves in any way. We, we are a prideful people, I think. And, and we like ourselves just the way we are, thank you very much, even if we are miserable. We don't put that together. We can't seem to make that equation work for us. So as we are on the path, we try to make it up our own way. We think, oh, here in America, since we're different, the path should be different. You can't do that, or there will be no result. It's like planting an apple seed and expecting a banana to grow out from it. It's simply not going to happen. No matter how carefully you tend that seed, it's not going to happen. What I see now, especially online, I don't know if many of you know, but I live online. And this is how people know I actually exist. 
<laughs> but online I've come into contact with many people that when they hear about, for instance, the subject of lineage, they don't like that. Because they feel that lineage is just an idea and it, it doesn't really mean anything um, if you just take a teaching from a teacher, then that's an exact transmission. That's not true. If you don't have lineage, you cannot trace the origins of the teachings, so you don't know if they're pure. With lineage, you know that one teacher transfers the teaching to his student, transfers the teaching to his student or hers, transfers the teaching and keeps on going. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but in empowerments, uh, the case is that um, the Lama will always say, this is who I received this empowerment from. And these were the conditions. And this is the cycle that it originates in. For instance, the Nam Chu, which is what we practice here. So having done that, um, having looked towards practice that is stage by stage, we are making some uh, progress. But in fact, those that are grabbing a teaching from here and grabbing a teaching from here never know if the teaching that they're giving has the power of the original source. Anyone can stand up and sound like a teacher. Most of us can, anyway. And online, for instance, I see more spiritual gobbledygook than you could possibly imagine. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. And, and, and you would ask, where did you get that from? I just know it. And then you tell it to another person, and another person thinks they got a real teaching. And it's a rip-off, it's a theft. There is no real teaching, and it has no real blessing. Buddha's teachings come from the Buddha, from the primordial Buddha nature, whether it came from the actual uh, historical Buddha, or whether it came from another in his line that also gained realization. It doesn't matter so long as it traces back. And if you can't trace it back in a straight line, you have nothing. When the Lamas first came to the United States, they uh, did not want to give out Dzogchen teachings, the deepest, most profound ones. They had no use for that. They felt that without the, the foundation, the house simply could not be built. And the idea was that without preparation, without the mind being softened through stage by stage practice, that what happens is, uh, it's like the seed falls on concrete. There's no gentleness, no softness, no preparation. So if the if field has not been plowed, um, the, 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 the dirt is hard, it's uh, impenetrable, um, there's no air in it, there's very little nutrition in it. Gradually the field has to be plowed and nutrients are plowed into it, and that's the way nature works. Uh, when nature is working, in a, in, when man is working with nature. But here, if you're throwing seeds on concrete or on asphalt, of course nothing's going to happen. And why? Because there's nothing there to nourish it. It's too hard. We are like that here in America. We are so sure that we are the greatest country on earth that we feel that you, know, you can be no better than an American. How do I feel about that? I don't even think that makes sense. It's not like that. We are of the same nature. We are of the same taste. There is nothing all that different about us. 
um, we all have uh, capabilities and we all have fallbacks and we all have inconsistencies and we all have moods and we all have all kinds of stuff that make us very same very much the same well, what really makes us the same is our nature our nature being the primordial ground of Buddhahood the m slimiest little worm that you could find in the ground and the greatest most handsome fellow you could possibly imagine maybe even the president of the United States have the same nature they don't have the same salary <laughs> <laughs> but they have the same nature. And so for those of us that get all big and, you know, uh, egocentric about ourselves and try to make up our own religion, there's no hope to that. If we really look at what's happening, we have a nature, we have a path by which to awaken to that nature or to accomplish that nature, and then we have a result. And once again, if we don't play it that way, if we don't use it that way, the way it's always been, tradition, we won't get the same result. Um, there's also a trend now where you, it's like an instant enlightenment and you feel that you've gotten it just like that. Nothing about you changes. Not one doggone thing. <laughs> Your life doesn't change. Your mood doesn't change. Nothing changes. And so how can that be? What is the difference? You have just decided that you've become enlightened and that's okay. I think you should decide that right now. But you also have to work on it. You have to actually accomplish. Accomplishment is what has to happen. So we need to change and we need to face the fact that if we are in a samsaric environment now and we're not all that happy about it, it's going to take change to make a difference. One of the things that Americans now believe is that it doesn't matter about qualities or how you act. All that really matters is how you feel about yourself. I know, it's a little odd, isn't it? How you feel about yourself and whether or not you feel like um, you are ready or awake or whatever your term is, you feel like that. You just wake up one day and you decide it. And there's this, this one guy online I know that sits under a tree every day because he feels that. He's awake. How would we know? I mean, how does he know? He's never taken a teaching in his life. But he has this idea. Now, in other countries where the Dharma was born, we know that there has to be a step-by-step. -step. Here in America, not only do we not realize that it's up to us to change and that we have the capacity to change right here, but we also feel that it's okay to say that you're enlightened or aware or a Buddha and then be mean as a snake. I've seen that so much. Now, I have moods. Everybody's got moods. But I've seen people who are so filled with hate and yet they declare themselves to be wisdom beings. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that it is possible to be completely hateful and then say that you are Buddha and say that you are awake and that you have accomplished the path and that you've realized it? Isn't it good to look into the mirror and find out who you really are? Because when you look in the mirror, you're going to see who you were in the past, who you are now, and who you'll probably be in the future. And it's by your reflection. You look at yourself and you determine. You determine what your progress actually is.
We have to have self-honesty on the path. We cannot delude ourselves. And delusion has taken over Buddhism in America. There's just no doubt to it. There are now many lineages starting to break up. And this is the time that was predicted, the time of darkness. They're starting to separate. People are starting to act in a selfish way where somebody from a lineage will say, well, I want this. And from the same lineage will say, I want that. And they have to make a way together. They have to keep together as one uh, healthy body um, of uh, Buddhism and to keep together as a lineage. But now that other people are splitting off into different things. Now Zen. Um, Zen is real. I mean, it's, you know, people practice Zen. But when you read about what they're doing online, since there is not the same kind of um, empowerment stage by stage by stage, it's, 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 it's becoming trashed by people who feel that suddenly they are Zen itself. They've had no training, no experience, no nothing. And yet they feel that they have that. It's, it's hard to understand why everything is coming apart in this way. And I do believe that it's because we are not aware any longer of uh, what it takes to accomplish stage by stage. I really think that's the main thing. For instance, we now think the Noble Eightfold Path is really not so important because we're doing Dzogchen. Don't know the Eightfold Path, aren't very familiar with it, but we can even deny that the Buddha taught it because we don't know anything. I've seen that online. Deny the Buddha taught it. Is that, it's crazy. For instance, the Buddha said we must have right view. That is a pure understanding, a pure awakened view of one thing, for instance, that samsara is flawed. And that in order to uh, end suffering, we must abandon samsara. And to abandon samsara, we must see the correct view, which is the view of primordial wisdom nature. Not our habits and our foible, foibles and, and so forth as being what we are, but our primordial wisdom nature being what we are. We have to change that view. And now, again, here's another view, another exam example. This is only the Eightfold Path, and they say, oh, that's just at the beginning. It's not so important. But then when you go to Dzogchen, you rely completely on uh, devotion. You must be able to see your teacher as the face of primordial nature. And it's not the personality that you move toward, but you use the personality as a doorway. This person, this one that's called guru, can give you the correct teachings, can pass them on to you, or can get somebody in the same lineage to pass them on to you, and then teach accordingly. And this is the way it goes. You, uh, t you have to have that right view. In Dzogchen, we come to understand that all men are dakas, all women are dakinis in their nature. Now you can get up and go out in the street and act the fool and um, are you still a DACA? In your nature you are, <laughs> but right now you're in the street acting a fool. <laughs> and it's kind of odd. So we don't hold ourselves to any particular standards. It's like we just want to be that way. And we figure since there's so many people on the planet now and so few teachers really, a lot of teachers have been passing away, the good ones, the older ones. Since there's not a lot of teachers around anymore, the older ones with the real experience, we're all jumbled up. We're all jumbled up, and we don't really know what true Dharma is anymore. Now, 
let's say we look at the second of the uh, Eightfold Path, right thought. Many of us are thinking that we are becoming Buddhas day in and day in because we wear the outfit, for one thing. And we have the beads. And we, um, we have the books. And we have the Zen. So that must make us Buddhist. <laughs> Yay! No, it doesn't. It makes us dressed. <laughs> right thought is different. What makes you a Buddhist is to realize in the way the Buddha taught that some things are right and some things are not. For instance, if you were to think in a hateful way, you could be saying the words, I love you, you are so beautiful to me, and I love you so much, and just being so nice and so candy you know, super sweet. And yet at the same time, in your head, you're thinking, Ugh! horrible, ugly thoughts. Thoughts that um, you would, wouldn't like to think that your Buddhist companion was thinking. You would like to think that you could depend on the Sangha to be doing the right thing. Thought should be loving, kind, it should be constructive. Hate is not a good thought process. These are the things that uh, we should avoid. And yet again, here in this country, we don't make that distinction. Many people don't make that distinction. Again, I point you to the internets. <laughs> The internets on the internets. And there, there is no awareness then. Again, you have to change. You have to think in a certain way. You have to educate yourself. You have to see what it is the Buddha has ta thought, uh, taught, and you have to contemplate it. You have to learn it. But we don't understand that. There's right speech. I see hateful speech from Buddhists all the time hateful and they'll come online and argue with you about something that you just got maybe from a book that is a, a proper book and it, we know where it came from and we know who translated it and all of that and yet hateful people will come online and say no I know better I know better and here's how it really is although it's not based on anything that was ever taught at any time so this is where Buddhism is breaking up. Used to be that we were not to gossip about each other, for instance, and now it's all we do. It's all we do. And that's right speech. Right speech ought to be, well, you shouldn't be cussing your fool, you know what, off. That would be cussing, wouldn't it? You shouldn't be speaking in a way that hurts, causes pain, causes confusion, causes divisiveness. It's one of the things that's very, very important. In fact, His Holiness Panarimpache once said, one thing I ask of you is to not divide the Sangha, to not make hatred or problems in the Sangha. The Sangha is like a great family that support and care for each other and it, and it is by the efforts of the Sangha that we'll properly learn how to be Buddhists and we will gain the strength from leaning on each other and staying together. But if we don't do that and all we do is we're you know hateful toward each other, we gossip and we're um, separating rather than coming together, this is not the way and no good will result from it. We could wear the uniforms our whole lives and no good will come of it. Right action. Okay, I'm a Buddhist, but maybe I'll get a gun. Or I'm a Buddhist, but maybe I'll rob banks. 
I know, I'm a Buddhist, so maybe I'll rob banks and give it to the Buddhists. <laughs> it's like we, we're confused. We don't really understand how to think or how to speak or how to act. Right action is that which brings happiness, peace, joy, help. We help each other. We help each other. And there are many other ways to look at it as well. For instance, in right action, there, I don't know how many of you have ever heard that old story about the great bodhisattva who saw, saw that a bunch of arhats were on this boat and they were about to be carried away, but there was a murderer on the boat. And so in order to keep the arhats safe, shot the murderer, or killed the murderer, put an arrow, I don't know, something. And so the murderer was never able to carry out his crime, and it, a hundred arhats or whatever it was were saved arhats being those that are studying buddhism and have kept their vows very purely and have made some accomplishment so if one murderer is laid down in order to keep a hundred others safe and secure i would call that right action and it's been taught in that way but you can't think like that until you've thought through every other possibility. I'm sure he didn't have time, that wonderful bodhisattva. I'm sure he didn't sit there and go, wait a minute, let me get the book. You know, and <laughs> try to, <laughs> how do I do this? What, what's the choice? Um, I have to go look it up. I'm sure he didn't have that, but his instinct, as the bodhisattva told him, act quickly. And so what was his motivation? He wanted to save the Arhats. Did he want to kill the killer? No. He wanted to save the Arhats. And so that's quick thought and right action. Now, should we all go get, what, what are those things called, Uzis? They're the really bad guns, aren't they? Uh, should we all go get Uzis and start pointing them at each other because we're all flawed? <laughs> no, that doesn't help anybody, it doesn't do any good, it causes suffering, and that's not right action. Anything that causes suffering is not right action. And so then we look at right livelihood. What should you do um, as a Buddhist, moving along on the path, making some progress for right livelihood? What do you think you should do? It would be great to be a doctor, because doctors help people. It would be great to be a counselor. Counselors help people. It would be great to be a translator of Dharma. They really help people. It would be great to be a teacher. Teachers help people. Would it be great to be a bank robber? I don't think so, because what if, even if you took from the bank and gave it to somebody that would use it more skillfully and more ethically, thank you. Still, it's not your money to give. You gave away somebody else's money. So we learn to be generous, but we learn to do it in a right way. We learn to give, but we learn to do it so that nobody gets hurt. That's one of the things I like about um, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy DC. You guys are doing what you're doing to benefit beings. It looks a little rough sometimes, and it looks a little rough from the outside, and sometimes people show shock on their faces when they see this. But I know why you're doing it. And I think you're doing right activity. If you could somehow balance 
help us balance, help us stay alert, help us stay awake so that we can balance the good in this society with what we don't have and make things more even, even so that everybody has uh, food, medical care, and homes, warmth or cool, whatever they need. These sort of things we work towards sharing the great wealth that all of us have, that all of us are, might be able to share, and that is indeed in this country, taking it away from maybe the crazy guys that are spending it left and right, and for no good reason, only selfish reasons. We instead would like to, you know, see that everyone has what they need. And that's what I call right livelihood, and it even moves into right effort. If you are looking to uh, follow the Buddhist path, you would not want to be like a gun salesperson. You would not want to be a weapon maker. You would not want to make, um, you know, poison or chemical substances. You would not want to cover up for instance, the Japanese uh, situation with the um, Fukushima, you would not cover up so that the people cannot take action that benefits them. You would do the right thing, the ethical thing, and have people in a position where they can do what is necessary to do to maintain their health, even if it means leaving their country. So we have to have ethics, and that ethical living is right effort, right livelihood. Right effort would be, let's say, if you're, again, if you're robbing a bank and you're taking it home, that's one thing. That's not so good. But if you're making money and you're passing it out, money's good. Then money's good. You pass it out, you help. I do. I'm, I'm broke, for instance. <laughs> I'll pass around right now. Um, I mean, I am broke. And it's because I spend all my money on feeding wild animals, on Garuda aviary, on animal uh, welfare uh, things, you know, um, groups and so forth. Um, online sometimes I try to raise funds for other people. So I think that's good. That's good. And I'm poor. And I, I really don't mind that much. Really don't mind that much. Because I found that somebody's always ready to give me a beautiful house. Why is that? It's not that I'm so great. It's that wherever I go I put up birdhouses. Karma is wonderful. <laughs> and wherever I go, people like to feed me lovely things, which is why I'm so fat. But I know why that happens. That's because I'm always feeding the animals. I do nothing but feed animals all the time. Um, I rescue them. Many, many, many dogs and cats have kept their lives because of work that, that I've done. And now if I had arranged things differently and money had stayed within the Sangha, we would be a lot better off. Many Sanghas have great big uh, um, sponsors that give generously. We don't really have that. We have a bunch of people that give their little $10, a little $20, maybe $1,000. We have a bunch of people who are willingly sharing to keep this dream alive. And that is right effort. We've helped many people during Katrina, uh, during the uh, hurricanes. We've helped many people. We've helped their animals. We've helped them to get food. Uh, we've done things like that on, on a, turning on a dime. Because that's what's most important. 
I mean, we would all like not. I'd like a new car. <laughs> I have a new old car. <laughs> no, I don't need anything. I'm I'm happy and. Um, the effort of being able to benefit sentient beings. Oh, that was another thing. He, um, my sangha, when, when we first started uh, in the winter time, bringing food to um, Occupy uh, K Street, and Occ at Occupy DC, uh, we, we did some magnificent meals. I mean, we really went all out. We have pictures of roasted vegetables and stuff that we can show you. And we, we, we really went all out. We bring it all the time. And then we started running out of money. <laughs> and so I said, well, here's the bad news. We might have to step back on the uh, quality and the, uh, not the quality, but the uh, fanciness of the food. But we're going to do this at least three nights a week. My sangha looked at me like I was crazy. You, how, can we, how can we do this? Well, we've been doing it. At least I think we're still doing it, aren't we? Yeah. And uh, the first few meals I was able to help cook myself, and then after that I wasn't able to. But we're still doing it. That's the kind of thing that we do, rather than making ourselves a rich sangha. That's what I want to do. I want to see people eat. I want to see them fed. I want to see them clothed. I want to see them housed. That's what I want to do. And even though the Buddha taught this, I'm afraid to tell you that there aren't that many Buddhists that actually give. There's a lot of good things about us, but the reason why that is is that in Tibet, for instance, where our kind of Buddhism really began, everybody was poor. It was hard to grow anything to eat. The climate was really weird. <laughs> and uh, it frozen. And so most people lived on Sampa, which is just roasted barley. So they had no money, they were nomadic people. So whatever they would do, they would give some little money to the um, monasteries. And the monasteries were the only ones that had any wealth. It wasn't because they were trying to keep it to themselves. They would actually feed the villages around them. So it was a circular thing. But people knew that if they gave some money to the temples, that they would have gained merit and that they'll be happier. That they knew that. They were taught that from childhood. They didn't have the habit of giving money to other people. They gave it to the monastery, and the monastery gave it out. And so many people don't want to hear about giving money to the monastery because they think, oh, that's feudalism or something. Hello? You want a piece of land? <laughs> You can have that much. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> Plow it up. <laughs> so, and that is the way that instinctively people act in Buddhism. Now, here in America, it's not like that because we are used to giving. But Buddhists are not giving in America. So that's, that's very strange. I'd like to mention that because I would like to change it. I would like it to, change it to change it a lot. And they say it's because we're poor. Yeah, we're poor, but we can always scrape something together. Sure, we make a lot of offerings to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas because it'll make all sentient beings happy. And we believe that thoroughly and completely with all of our hearts. But we'll feed you. We'll dress you. We'll do whatever we can. Whatever you need, if we can do it, we'll do it. And I'd like to see Buddhists in America really live like that. Right mindfulness. Okay, here, here's the thing with mindfulness. Mostly we just kind of
go to practice every day, which is we do a little practice, some prayers, a little mantra, and then sometimes go on retreat, retreat. and then other times um, we go to a teaching or we go to a picnic to, with, the, with the Buddhists or we go and take a course. Um, I know M Michelle over there has studied so much. She could get up here and teach this class. Yeah, you. She's brilliant. And about right mi mindfulness, it's keeping one's attention on those things that are of benefit that really helps. What we do generally, though, is we'll say an hour during the day, three hours on the weekend, and the rest of the time we are as ordinary as jelly beans. Just as ordinary as you can be. We don't think kindly, we don't think mindfully, we don't remember the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, we don't remember the Sangha, we don't remember peace, we don't remember love, we don't remember that others around us are hungry, we don't remember that others around us need we forget everything, and then we go to class. That is not the way. It's not the way. Right mindfulness is right mindfulness, and it keeps, and it's, and it's that we keep in our wonderful little brains, in our awareness, we keep the awareness of the Buddha Dharma and all of its excellent propensities. We keep all the qualities of the deities and all that we've ever been taught. We keep this in our mind. We contemplate Dharma. Think about it. We have to be mindful because sometimes we do things that we don't understand are going to hurt us and make us miserable. So we have to contemplate. Right mindfulness is like that and right concentration is, for instance, if we're in a practice and we are uh, in or we are inner teaching and we are being taught or are reciting some mantra or doing some practice like that, um, we must concentrate on what we're doing and not be all over the place. There's no point in listening to a Dharma class or doing Dharma practice when you're all over the place because nothing takes, nothing takes the mind. One of the things that the Buddha Dharma does for you is it makes the mind very stable. So if you don't hold yourself to stability and hold yourself to concentration, you'll be all over the place and the practice will have done no good at all. If you can't stay awake for a practice, you can't stay awake for your life. If you can't be aware of those around you in a kind way, you can't be kind. You have to stop and think. And what I've noticed in Buddhism today here in America, there's not much thinking being done. And when there is, it's completely separate from the good qualities. You have the very, um, uh, intellectual types who are very, very good at mastering not only the language but the uh, uh, meaning of the words and they really have an understanding of the teaching and they learn the background of the teaching and who, the background of the teacher that taught the teaching and, and they really have that and they can name, which I think is a marvelous capacity they can name just about anything you need to name in Buddhism. I can't do that. I was born in Brooklyn, and I just never had that kind of training. But I know enough. And I also know that it is worthless to be totally intellectual in Buddhism when you have no good qualities. If you just pick up books and start reading them and receive no training, from an actual teacher who has those qualities, it won't do much good. You'll still make the same mistakes that you would have made if you had not been taught. 
So it's difficult to understand, but it is the case that um, you must be aware of what you're trying to accomplish and how it is that you do that, and you've got to stick with it. You know, stick with it until there is some kind of accomplishment. Some of us come here and just pray, play church. It's like we belong to this place and, you know, we just love it here. And yet we don't really concentrate on, we don't contemplate on good qualities. We don't contemplate on how to improve ourselves. We don't even admit that we need improvement. We don't help anybody. We don't bring comfort. We don't do any of those things except read. It doesn't help. So, my reason for coming here tonight is that I wanted to ask you all, from my heart, if you would go that route, rather than trying to accumulate information, do change. Do bring your mind to a more stable place. Only you can do this. In one way you can say, uh, the, the, the Buddha was born 2,500 years ago or whatever. Or you could say another Buddha was born 500 years ago. You could say all these different things, but the only Buddha is you. You are that. You are the Buddha, and you show many faces. And if you learn to tame your mind, to grow, to require of yourself more than you give now. Not in material goods, necessarily, but in benefiting others, in, 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 in being a source of light to the world. This is the real Dharma. The real Dharma benefits beings. It's called the Bodhicitta. And the Bodhicitta is not separate from Buddhahood. In fact, it's like the first movement of the primordial wisdom nature called Buddhahood. It is the first movement in the sense uh, it's like the sun. If Buddhahood is the sun, then bodhicitta are the rays. You can't separate the rays from the sun. Oh, maybe you can blast off a little bit. Don't get technical. But they are the same embodiment. And the bodhicitta is like that. It is basically the sun's energy. Okay? So the bodhicitta must come from us we are actually a display of the bodhicitta, but we have to live up to it. And we don't. We walk by day after day just doing what we think is the right thing to do. No matter what anybody else thinks. In America, it is no longer fashionable to be a bodhisattva. Did you know that? Isn't it amazing? Ani Sange and I tweet, uh, tweet a lot. And it, they argue with it. Being a bodhisattva is completely unnecessary. That's an old way of thinking. What? what, what, what? <laughs> Being kind is no longer necessary? I mean, I don't, you, what do you say to somebody like that? Let me kick you in the butt. I won't be kind to you. <laughs> but in fact, to, beco to become a Buddha, one must graduate through stage-by-stage stage bodhisattvahood. 
you grow from one level to another level called, called boomies, to another level, to another level, to another level, and then finally, all of the these uh, gross and subtle defilements are gone, and then w from the Bodhisattva springs the living Buddha. Not springs, I can't say it that way. One doesn't become the other. They are, and they have always been the same. There has never been any separation. It's perception that's different. And so we perceive the bodhicitta in order to benefit sentient beings by being a bodhisattva and returning again and again and again throughout the cycle of uh, death and rebirth in order to uh, become enlightened and aware. Once we become a, a bodhisattva on the higher bhumi, there is, there are defilements that we may be exposed to, but they're not ours. For it, uh, what does the Jiao Trimpache used to say? He used to say, it's like a person who is in a room full of smokers. You yourself may not be a smoker, but you're going to come out smelling like one. And it's very much like that. When bodhisattvas enter the world, they do so with one agenda. And that is to be of benefit, to bring comfort, to bring the method, to bring the, the way. You, we must have the method, and somebody must teach it. And so when bodhisattvas come, that is their one intention. Now we're saying that there's now our Westerners are saying, it, there's no such thing, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is learn the words. Where can this be coming from? Nobody was taught this. This is ridiculous. And it's what happens when you don't follow the path step by step by step by step by step. No.